Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Danny Storlene. I'm the girls director of coaching at Minnesota Thunder Academy. And we've got the pleasure and honor of having Tony Sane, CEO of the Sane Foundation and the most successful and decorated men's soccer player from Minnesota. Uh, Tony had a phenomenal career as a professional soccer player, including 43 appearances on the U.S. men's national team. That's most from any male player from Minnesota. Uh, Tony played his college soccer at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Division I school, uh, played multiple positions throughout his professional career uh, with teams including the Minnesota Thunder, uh, D.C. United, Heritage Berlin, FC Nuremberg, Columbus Crew, Chicago Fire, Colorado Rapids, and the L.A. Galaxy. Uh, one of the highlights of his time with the U.S. men's national team, Tony played every minute of every game in the 2002 World Cup in Korea and Japan. In 2003, while still at the height of his professional career, Tony created the Sane Foundation to leverage what he saw as soccer's unique potential to create positive social change for youth. Since his official retirement from soccer in 2010, Tony has served as president and CEO of the Sane Foundation, as well as, as a sports envoy for the U.S. Department of State. Tony believes in giving all children the opportunity to learn and grow and to learn, grow and succeed. With the Sane Foundation, he seeks to accomplish that goal through its program, partnership, and events. Welcome, Tony. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Danny. Uh, always great to see you. Uh, we're just going to jump into some questions tonight uh, and uh, to have Tony talk about uh, his experiences as an athlete, as a student, being recruited, as a professional player, uh, talk about his foundation and ways that uh, we can all help with the uh, soccer community here in, in Minnesota and, and other places like Haiti. Um, if you do have questions, you can put them in the Q&A and we will get to those uh, later on, but we'll just start with a few uh, general questions for Tony here. Um, if you could, Tony, uh, can you talk about your playing journey from your youth career, which I know you won a national championship as a youth player to a high school career winning a state championship in the college and MLS winning an MLS cup and then uh, the Bundesliga and, and your national team experiences. Well, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I grew up in the, in the twin cities and, you know, it's a, it's a long time period to, to go over, but um, you know, I did, I went to um, St. Paul Academy and um, lost to Danny in the state finals one of my years after had a, 50 uh some game on beaten streak um so he still brags about it that's the um, only thing i got on you tony um went on to college wisconsin milwaukee where um again we played against you at, at up there at, when you were at green bay um you know then i toiled around and there wasn't really established leagues and i, I left school a little bit early and i went to belgium and i got a, an ankle injury and then I came back and, and uh, was playing like indoor soccer and what was the A-League the equivalent to the USL now for a couple of years until Major League Soccer started. Um, Major League Soccer started, I, I held out and um, eventually uh, we negotiated a contract. I went to DC and we were one in six when I got there and we went on to, to win the championship there and spent three years in DC and won a couple of championships and then went on to Hertha Berlin and joined the national team and got lucky enough to play in the, in the Champions League and the UEFA Cup and then had a different experience, went to Nuremberg, um, which came from the second division. So totally different experience, um, fighting, battling relegation. Um, and actually the year I got hurt, um, they did get relegated and then they came back up. And then I, I came back to the States and jumped around and retired with the LA Galaxy in, in 19... No, 2009. So long career, a lot of stops, which we can get into if you ask more specifically. But, you know, uh, I think one of the cool things is about soccer is that it really brings people together. And, you know, I bet, um, you know, I, I, I'm assuming that you've either seen me in person play almost on every team that I've ever been on, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed coming. You might be the only one. And my mom watching you play all over the world. It was, it was a lot of fun. I'm glad we could share that experience. Uh, I remember, Tony, when you guys won the national championship as a youth player, uh, the only male team uh, to win the Burnsville Giants girls team uh, won a national championship. I know, as you know, and I remember you guys uh, calling my house collect back in that day when we didn't have cell phones and 
and all of those things. But we have a lot of youth players on here, obviously. And and talk about where that ranks in your experiences and, you know, playing with a lot of guys you grew up with and really close friends that you still have today. And, and talk, talk about that a little bit. Well, we tried to recruit Danny to play, but he wouldn't do it because he was stuck with those guys in Cottage Grove and Northern Lights, I believe it was. But, uh, you know, growing up, we had a great rivalry and really we had like three or four kind of big clubs. So um, the talent was spread apart, um, but there was always these friendly, friendly rivalries and, um, you know, winning the national championship was amazing. I remember kind of going there and we were some kids in Minnesota and we bought our own t-shirts as our uniforms and shorts. And, you know, I always, I always tell people, I mean, gear is great. And, um, I was sponsored by Adidas for 17 years. So I, I got lots of it, but, um, to be a great team, um, this is one area where we kind of coached ourselves that year. And then Buzz Lagos helped us. Um, um, and we had some other parents, but, we literally went and bought t-shirts and, and put Blackhawks on them and bought a pair of shorts for eight bucks each. And that was our uniform. So I remember going to the national championship and, you know, people are like, do they even play soccer in Minnesota? We're joking around. And this was before most people on this call were born, was born. So uh, 1990, I think it was. And uh, but we had a lot of great players from the Twin Cities, Manny Lagos, obviously from uh, with Minnesota United and Amos McGee as well. And um, then we had some other other people that, that came over, um, you know, our goalkeeper came over from Burnsville, Mitch Poppin and Jeff Kogo came over from Stillwater. So we recruited a couple of kids that final year and that pushed us over the edge to be able to win on a national level. Yeah. I can remember you sharing stories with me and saying, you know, all the cool things that you've done in soccer and even being able to do that with all your good buddies growing up and stuff. Uh, still one of your, one of your very favorite and memorable moments. Um, talk about strengths uh, that made you a successful player. I mean, you're you know the the greatest player in the history of male soccer in Minnesota, and and what are what are some of the strengths that that made you such an amazing player? Um, you know, I think I, I mean obviously I was really I was a, physically I was very um, gifted player. So when I ran a four four forty, um, you know I could pick a basketball up and dunk it off the ground without taking any steps. Um, and I worked really hard, you know, and, and so, you know, but the one thing is, is, you know, I think I was really good at controlling the controllable. So I was an honest player. Um, I could go into any locker room and team and look at where the weaknesses were. And I believe I started nine positions with the national team from the start of games and I played six positions in the champions league. So being versatile um, and a complete player and, you know, always putting the team first, that's what I would say was my biggest strength. Um, you know, as I got older, I got much smarter and was more of a director on the field. And I think when I was younger, because I was so physically gifted, you know, those pieces probably were overlooked. Um, and then as I got older and I was in Germany, more experienced, um, I was able to be more of a, a field general leader, you know, tactically a lot stronger. So, um, but, you know, I'd say if, if obviously, you know, you know, you, you, you can't teach speed, they say, um, but, you know, anticipation, um, paying attention, working hard and being a good team player, you know, made it so wherever I went in my career, I always had a place. And, and I think that's important. You see a lot of talented people, you know, that don't make it because of, of different reasons here or there. And uh, so I think by me willing to, to adapt and help the team win, that really helped me out a lot. So, Tony, you were a... Uh... All-American forward in high school and All-American forward in college. And you were a center midfielder on a championship team for DC United and uh, and a right back in the World Cup. And uh, I think I remember watching you play for the Chicago Power, was it, when you were, when they had the power play or short a player, whatever, and playing as like the goalkeeper. And um, I mean, you literally have played pretty much uh, everywhere, even in the state semifinal, when we played, you played in goal in the shootout for, for a few of the penalties. So, um, you didn't know. Help. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's great. We've tried to teach our kids about the, you know, being able to play multiple positions because it's going to certainly help you out down the, down the road. What about the recruiting process? I know 30 years, uh, times change uh, a lot, but you're ending up at the university of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, a division one school. We had a lot of Minnesota guys that went in our generation that played there, but 
Can you talk a little bit about uh, your process in recruiting? I know things are significantly different today, but what was it like for you? Yeah, I'm just gonna go back on your 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 last question though before I before I answer that. Um, you know, I think one of the things is you know when we play in clubs today, you know, coaches tend to see us in one way our whole careers, and so I really I I challenge people if you play in high school in a club. Um, to try to play different positions, try to play up a couple of age groups when you can with pickup soccer, because um, then you got to work on different strengths. And, you know, if you're a forward and you and you work on your defense, you know, a guy like Wayne Rooney steals the ball six times from four checking basically and, and, and scores six more goals a game. And it's the difference between 15 goals and 21 goals, right, from, from an all-star to an all-league. And, and uh, you know, as a defender, you know, trying to play forward and getting better at passing as a right back, you only have to make four good runs a game up the field and two crosses and you're a hero. So, you know, really working on those other parts of your game um, when you get chance, especially if you're playing pickup, um, lets you work on things outside your element. So that's where, you know, I, I know it's challenging when we have coaches that see us the same way all the time. Uh, but sometimes when we go and we can get outside of our comfort zone, it's great to try new things. Um, you know, even in, in college in the recruiting process, you know, I knew I was going to stay close because, you know, I was raised by a single mother. So um, the only division one schools were Wisconsin schools or Drake and, and Creighton. And so I wanted to stay cl as close as possible. Um, and at the time I was enrolled in Madison uh, and I was all set to go there. Uh, it, it was, you know, Manny Lagos was my best friend in high school and he was going to UVA, which was the number one school. And you know, we kind of had that talk when that trip we made to the Dallas Cup, I believe you were there. And, uh, you know, we had just lost in the semifinals to, to a team with, you know, nine national team players and mostly US, UCLA guys. And we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, I guess this is going to be our last run because we're going a different way. And, you know, we kind of said there was only one school on our list. And I kind of said, I'll go if you go. And he said, I'll go if you go. And we talked to our parents and, um, we ended up at the same school, but so the recruiting process was a little bit different um, for us because, um, you know, back then people didn't look as much. So you kind of had to go and, you know, people were skeptical about people from Minnesota. And I think now we have a great brand and recognition. Um, but the one thing when coaches call me, you know, coaches don't want to be friends with parents and, and coaches want good kids around. So when you're selling yourself, you know, what you do on the field, everybody knows about. But the pieces that you can sell is, you know, are you somebody that a, a coach wants around? Are you someone that's going to make the locker room better? Are you going to be a pain in the butt for the next four years? Are they going to have to put up with you, right? Because they have choices now. And, and you know, people don't want to be in a stressful, toxic situation. So if, if you can, first of all, you got to act the right way. But sell your skills on being a good team player, on being someone, you know, that everyone wants to be around. And quite frankly, that's going to make your team better now and, and, and people be more enjoyable. And, you know, one thing that's different now than before is, um, you know, I, I wonder because kids switch teams a lot, right. And they get developed and now they go to these super teams. And, and so your friends, it's not like when we were young, we played with the same kids when we were 10 to 9, 21, right. And so whether you join a team at 14 or 16, it's harder to learn that professional aspect, which is really being like a good friend. Um, you know, when you're on the field and your friends are there, you don't care about your man. You, you're helping your buddy out. And if something happens to you, you're, somebody else will help you out. And so I think that's a quality that's missing in a lot of youth right now because we're so worried about our positions. But that's the kind of person a college coach is looking for someone that's going to go and be a team player and risk it all to make sure he helps somebody else, even if it ends up, he ends up looking bad for it in the end. That's a great perspective, Tony. Thanks for that. Um, what about uh, Nash, your national team experience? Um, what was, you know, maybe your most memorable game with the national team? Uh, some of the guys you played with that were maybe favorite or top players that you played with a uh, funny story about, a Frankie Hayduke or someone like that. Uh, I know you've got some good good stories on that, but you've got some um, some amazing experience with the national team. I I've seen you play. I don't know, probably ten times for the national team. 
of your 43 games. And, and there were some very memorable ones for me as a fan and a friend, but uh, what, 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 what about for you? Well, a couple, you know, I didn't play as many games as I would have liked to, because, you know, in my prime, my, my, um, my, uh, my coaches in, in Europe didn't allow me to come to friendlies. And so I only played like in the qualifiers or, or important games, but you know, I remember my very first game and, um, you know, Frankie Haddock was my roommate. And so I flew to LA and it was a trip to China. And, you know, I was like, well, where's my roommate? Cause all of his stuff wasn't there. And uh, he, he just never came. And, you know, he's an amazing guy, can run forever, but um, there were some big waves in town, they said. And so Frank decided to leave the national team to go surfing. <laughs> and, you know, he was a young kid, but, you know, that's what he was about. And uh, on the field, there's no one I've ever played with that worked harder than Frankie. But um, it's just, you know, it's amazing how it all worked out for him. But that was my, my first experience. Um, with Frankie and, and on the national team. And, um, you know, I remember, you know, playing with some really good players and Eric Ronaldo was really great. And one time, like I dribbled through nine guys at practice and, and shot it over and he just started laughing at me. And I'm like, well, wh you know, why are you being a, a jerk? And he's like, he's like, no, no, I'm just laughing. He's like, if I could do half of what you do, he goes, I would be, he goes, you know how hard I work for one shot? He goes, if I get in front of the goal, he goes, I score or put on goal. He goes, you beat nine guys and then you pissed it away. So um, another guy had a coach, Elkis, who was a Greek national team coach. And they really worked on like everything you do is, is great. But what do you do in that final third on both halves? Right. And they say that final pass or that final shot. So, you know, all that hard work sometimes is wasted when we don't prepare and, and concentrate. At the same time, you know, players that do great in that final third can, can be awesome. So, um, you know, I've, I've kind of trained myself to, to try to, one, focus more defensively in the final third where, where, where you can lose game. Um, and then offensively, you know, be in the kind of condition that I can, I can still go. Um, you know, obviously playing in the World Cup was, you know, the most memorable. That and, you know, the Champions League is pretty cool, too, because it's night games. They play under the lights and you know that music, uh, you know, you walk out on the field. Um, I can't lie. Like you, you feel like you're in that commercial when you're watching the games and, and you're playing like, you know, obviously big teams. We played Chelsea, Barcelona, AC Milan, I think was in our group, uh, Porto, Prague. So you're playing these great teams, great stadiums um, and that music and you just, you know, it's, it's awesome. But, but the world cup, um, you know, puts an icing on it because you're playing for your country. Um, you know, there's a billion people. Nobody else is playing. Uh, you know, fortunately for us, when I was in the World Cup, we I like to say the one we won games. Um, and, you know, we, we made a great run and we surprised people. But I think it's the way we played, too. You know, we, we came out and basically told people, like, if you're going to beat us, you're going to beat us. But we're not going to lay back. We're not going to, you know, um, let you come at us like we're going to go toe to toe and, and see who walks away with this. Winning that first match versus Portugal, uh, playing in front of a 99% South Korean uh, crowd or uh, beating Mexico in the round of 16, which of those three? I mean, those games are amazing as a fan, uh, but, but what about for you? You know, I would probably say, you know, the Portugal one, because they were, you know, ranked third in the world. You know, I was marking Luis Figo, the, the reigning player of the world. Um, you know, obviously beating Mexico is special in the quarterfinals, but, you know, being able to, to kind of shock the world um, and to go up 3-0 against a team of that caliber was, was amazing. And, you know, I think for us then it was a matter of just hanging on and um, we were tired and cramping and, um, but we had the world behind us and I think we sold the hearts of the Koreans. Um, and so that was probably the most memorable, you know, world cup game. Very cool. Um, my favorite one, maybe, well, the Mexico one, two, zero, I, I think the game in Columbus in 2001, the qualifier when it was 20 some degrees and Mexico didn't come out and warm up and you were, you were the only guy in the field in short sleeves. And I, I still think to this day you were freezing, but, the first, so for the record, I'll just say 
I was an idiot. <laughs> you know, I was gonna like outsmart you know the Mexican team, and I just had to wear you know no gloves, I think, or or and and short sleeves, and it was like it was like the dumbest thing I've ever done. And yeah, I was, I was crazy. And, um, <laughs> And I remember I got kicked in there and I hurt my ankle. So after that game, I ended up like not being able to play um, for a couple of days. And then um, I also like that's one of the few games where I think I got a concussion. There was a fight on the field and Luis Hernandez was chasing somebody and I stepped in front of him and he just sidestepped me and just hit me in the elbow running full speed on my chin. And I remember going down and I remember thinking like, I'm going to get him. And I, and I tried to get up. And I stumbled and then uh, Chris Armas came to me. He put his hand on my shoulder. He's like, just stay down. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, he goes, he goes, just stay down. And so I stood down and even to this day, I don't quite remember the, the second half of the game uh, when, we, when we hung on. Uh, some amazing stories, Tony. Um, how about leadership? Uh, this is kind of our leadership academy. So you know, you've obviously played with some great players. Uh, who are some of the great leaders and why were they great leaders, people that you played with over the course of your career, whether it was high school or club or uh, professionally, national team, and, and why? Why were they people that, you know, I know obviously you were a great leader, but some of the other people that you played with and, and what made you a great leader? Well, you know, I think... Um... You know, Chris Armis is probably the, my favorite teammate of all time that I played with. And he was a great leader because he was, he was empathetic. You know, he led by example. He was good. You know, he didn't hide. You know, he didn't care about the glory. And then he also showed up when it mattered, right? And, you know, you have different people that want to be out in front of the public. But then you have some people that just do it day in and day out. Um, and he was one of those guys. So. He was one of my favorite teammates that I've ever played with. Um, and by normally, you know, on a professional level, you know, the guys that are going to lead are the guys that can back it up, right? And the guys that are going to get the best out of everybody. And that goes from being a good practice player, you know, like, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you pick certain people on your team in practice just to build team cohesion, um, to make them feel included, um, you know, Sometimes, you know, you're willing to give up something um, for other people. Uh, so, you know, the good leader, you know, put the team first, um, make people think about winning, um, but also can back it up. And for that reason, like Chris Armand was, was a great leader. You know, I played with Eddie Pope, another great leader, but totally different. Eddie was quiet and just did his job and um, he did his job and nobody ever questioned anything about him because you knew he was going to show up and you were going to get a hundred percent effort out of him. Those guys, I mean, this is from the outside looking in, I've just felt like they were so accountable and so responsible as, as, as players. Is that fair from someone from the outside saying that about them? Definitely. You definitely, those guys didn't take any shortcuts ever and they didn't care about looking bad and they only cared about winning and they, and they were great, great teammates. Awesome. Uh, your foundation. Let's talk about that a little bit. Wow. What, what, what amazing stuff. I remember, uh, I don't know what, I think it was right during the pandemic and sitting in your house and we were talking about it. And, you know, I, I thought I knew a lot about the, the foundation and you, you know, you blew my mind away with some of the things that you, that you've done with it. And I thought I knew, you know, a fair amount just from, you know, our, our friendship and following soccer and following you and, um, you started in 2003, is that right, with the foundation? Yeah, we made it a legal entity then, but it really didn't, you know, start moving until I, I retired in 2009. Um, and so, you know, we started off doing anti-racism work in sports camp, and actually we're about to, to do, um, you know, um, sign a league-wide deal with um, MLS Next to do some equity work for all the parents and kids, you know, in the, in the country. Um, but then we did, we, we put mentors in schools, um, to help kids and do after school programs. So, um, and while you're a mentor, you can get your master's degree to, and then become a teacher. So looking at the next generation of teachers, uh, we, we do housing support for them in the summertime. We, we hold free summer camps for about 8,000 kids and we'll have, you know, 50 summer interns that are doing it for free and another hundred that are getting paid. 
um, high school kids to run the camps. The camps are free for, for kids six to 12 years old. Uh, we, we do food distribution. We've done 3 million pounds in the last year. Um, obviously, you know, we've had years where we've had some of our kids from our program in Haiti come over and they've played with you and we still do that. We haven't been there a while. It's, it's a little dangerous. Um, um, and lastly, we, we run a community center on the east side of St. Paul that we're finishing off this $13 million, you know, campaign. So, you know, if, you, if kids want to get there, it's going to be, you know, open. We're going to have special fields for girls and boys um, for just pick up soccer after school. So, you know, if you want to go in on, on days off and before five o'clock, we won't allow any teams on it. We'll just have full dome space with, you know, pick up games for the community and, um, hopefully we'll have some great mentors around and people can get to know each other. So really just trying to build an, uh, an environment where we make the community healthier by giving opportunities through education and, and on and off the field. You know, that night that was the, we, we talked about earlier before you told us about the foundation and, you know, all the amazing things you've done on the field. We've known each other for as long as I can remember, but uh, I mean, I'm, I've never been more proud of you when you told me all that stuff and, like I said, you were an amazing player, an amazing friend, and but that leadership you're you're providing in the community is is unbelievable. And I know you've uh, still got a lot of things to do and bigger and better. How can how can we help as people that are in the soccer community that that have time want to give back? We've got a lot of students that need um, community service hours because they're in different programs, and obviously it looks great on a on a college application, uh, NHS students, that kind of stuff. What can what can we do as a soccer community, as MTA, to to do something for the Sane Foundation? Well, I think it's just get to know us, and then and, you know, I think if you if you email us and get to know us, I think you'll you'll realize what opportunities are there. You know, Dave Golan too is you know he's moving, but in the past we've done um, some you know mentoring with the college recruitment process, so. Um, and that opportunity was there in the past. We're not quite sure what's going to happen after Dave leaves, but, um, you know, really is get to know us and, you know, whether you, you come to volunteer to distribute food one day or coach a camp or, or participate at one of our events where we're going to have, you know, different tournaments. I know COVID kind of struck, we were going to have a, a mixture tournament where everyone was going to join different teams, um, and really just ways to bring the community together. But, um, come on by and see what we do and ask for information and, if you're looking for volunteer hours or job or um, a program to get into, um, we, we may be working at your school or, or not, but um, the best way to, to get involved is, you know, start by connecting and maybe come from an infomercial and, you know, we'd be happy if you knew you, you wanted a group of people to come by, we, we could kind of go through everything and, and talk about some different opportunities. And, you know, one of the things that's going to be cool is we are going to have the, the safest, nicest turf field in Minnesota. And, you know, we put an extra pad on it. We don't have any rubber infill. Um, so it's going to be pretty sweet. So if you just want a great place to play and come and um, be in our community, you know, you're always welcome. That's great. We've uh, we certainly got to get more involved in in your foundation. I know we've had a few things here and there, but I feel like we've we've not done done enough. Um, People, uh, we're kind of getting to the point here where we're looking for questions now. Uh, you know, we kind of did a lot of talking, Tony and I did here, and looking for if you've got questions for for Tony, you can put them in the the, the Q and A, um, and we can we can certainly answer some of those questions. We're kind of in uh, shooting for the forty five minute uh, for the session here, so uh, if you've got questions, please type them in uh, the Q and A. We've got one in here. I'm not sure if I understand all the way, but it says. Do you think the your foundation will engage other communities in Minnesota? Well, um, yeah, you know, like we are in the Southern County metro area. So we actually have programming in, in the St. Cloud schools. Um, in the past, we've been in the Rochester schools. Uh, we have mentors in Burnsville, North St. Paul right now. Um, we did get state funding, so we are looking to expand that. And as we, as we move our school-based programs, our camps will follow. So we have a new partnership with hy V as well. So we'll look to be doing more camps in areas where there are Hy-Vee stores for those communities, which will include the whole seven metro area. That's great. 
Uh, Justin Kelly, just I think more of a statement here. He says, Tony, Minnesota United needs a number nine. Would that be a good fit? Um, <laughs> Justin Kelly would actually be a great fit. Uh, Justin Kelly was a forward back in the day for the Blackhawks, went to St. Thomas, and um, he could score goals and he was fast. But, uh, you know, I think one of the, the good things about United is they're really deep and you don't really miss a player when they're gone. And the bad thing is, is they're missing a couple of special players in a couple of roles. So, you know, getting a consistent score um, that you can count on that can hold the ball up. Um, and, you know, the truth is, is they may have them on the team. They're just not using them correctly or they need to go find somebody, but they need to have confidence in someone to leave them there so that the team develops an identity around that. And you have that consistency um, because, you know, as, as great as, as it is um, when the other team is, is looking for where it's coming from, you still need consistency. And, you know, you look at the great teams like, you know, Barcelona never won without, you know, a strong piece up top in the middle, you know, that they could count on. So you got to build that um, same way, you, you know, you want to build on the middle of the field. Uh, Anthony Tringali asks, uh, what was the best piece of advice someone has ever told you? Um, best piece of advice that I can share here. Um, <laughs> the best piece of advice people told me was just, you know, um, work hard and be yourself, right? Um, you know, other people don't dictate who you are and, you know, nobody knows like when you're done growing, when you're done developing, um, you know, I, if, you know, I went to college, I graduated high school at 18, but I was 19 by the time I ended up on college campus. You know, if I would have, you know, ended two years earlier, maybe they would have said, you're never going to play here at college, right? It really didn't matter because by 26, I was in the top 10 players in the country. But I might have stopped at 17 if I would have listened or if I would have gone too far ahead. So I would say is, you know, find places that you're going to be successful, work hard, um, and, and you got to believe in yourself. Uh, Sam Diebold asks, uh, what kind of volunteer opportunities do you offer with your foundation? Um, well, we have everything from serving food to, you know, just field monitoring, um, coaching camps, um, tutoring other kids. Um, so, you know, park cleanup. So a lot of different things, you know, phone calls, um, stewardship, um, recruiting. So there's a lot of different opportunities. I know that there's a student board that they're setting up right now too. So um, I know that that's going to, you know, be on board as well. So there may be opportunities in leadership there as well. Uh, Kevin asks, how does your foundation affect the parents of athletes? Well, when we do our, our, our training, you know, our cultural competency training, I think it, it, it affects them a lot. Um, you know, one is, you know, I think parents and families really need to understand why they're signing up with a certain club. And, and you know, it's about the kids and not about them. And so really understanding that and, and working with clubs to, to be honest and open with the parents about the rules and the expectations um, is important. I think once everyone is clear on the expectations, it's easier for parents and kids to have an enjoyable time. And then sometimes we offer ways to, you know, where we can save money or, or recruit, redistribute gear. And um, at the end of the day, you know, you know, we want to create a better climate where everyone feels comfortable playing and, and it does become a family thing. If you had one piece of advice for the youth on the on the call here, what would what would that be? I know you've mentioned a few things and kind of go around and around a little bit here, but if you got one piece of advice to give someone, listen, to Coach Storlene. Um, okay. No, I, I I think is is you know be a good teammate. Um, I know it's hard, and and you know I hope this doesn't wrinkle any feathers, but you know you have so much going on with the team, um, but great players aren't made in practice, right? Um, in practice is where you learn the fundamentals and the blueprint, right? In school, you learn the ABCs and you learn, you know, but you go home to read a book, right? So how much time, you know, can you spend, you know, playing pickup with your friends, juggling in your backyard? You know, I used to go shoot against the wall. Me and the friends, we used to go, and if there was only two of us, we'd go with two balls. We'd kick one ball out there, and we play one-on-one -on -one with the other ball. And the only way you could score was kicking it against the other ball. So, you know, find ways um, 
and hopefully it's not work. Uh, me and Manny Lagos used to eat lunch in 15 minutes, so we'd have 30 minutes between class to go juggle, and we didn't stop until we had 100 head juggles um, in a row. So I think it's if you enjoy playing, and and I don't want you to do this if you don't enjoy playing, but find other ways to play. You know, make friends with the ball, and and hopefully you find some friends that are like-minded and enjoy doing the same thing. Uh, obstacles in your career. I know you've had some injuries over your career and some other challenges like anyone who's had a long, awesome career like you have. How were you able to overcome some of those? And we get a lot of kids, unfortunately, that get injured. I, I know you've dealt with a few tricky injuries over your career, but how did you handle the, the tough times, the challenges, the obstacles? Well, I think, you know, good coaches know that injuries are part of the game. And so you know, you can't really, you, they happen, right? Um, you know, what you can do is put yourself in a position to be in better shape, better position, better rested, um, so that you're less likely to get injured and, and you're stronger. But, you know, a lot of things happen because of other people on the field as well. So I think mentally, you know, you have to, you know, know your body, know your limits, but you got to be in shape and, and, and because the better you are physically, the less likely you are to get hurt. And, you know, obstacles that were, were tough. And in reading that other question, you know, like, you know, going to Germany, people say it was tough. And, but when you leave everyone you love and everything you know to go play soccer, you put everything you – that is the number one thing in your life. And when you give 100% to any one thing, it's a lot easier to be successful at that. So when I went to Germany, you know, the only thing that I was worried about was, was playing on the field. And, um, you know, luckily I had some friends, Danny came and visited me in, in Berlin a couple of times and in Nuremberg, um, which was great. Um, but my life really revolved around soccer at that point. And, you know, unfortunately it was a job. Fortunately, I love my job. So it wasn't like work. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, but it was so worth it for me. And, you know, I got to meet people from so many countries. I made a good living. Um, and I got to see things that I, that I never would have seen if I, if I hadn't had that career. Uh, so Jason's kind of follow up with this, uh, the adjustment with playing abroad. I mean, you talked about it a little bit. Um, what, what was, what was the hardest part of that? You know, the hardest part was just fitting in mentally and knowing that, you know, I think being an American playing abroad is even harder because there's the expectation that when everything happens not good, it's, oh, because you're an American and you're not good, right? You don't get credit for being good. And the reason why everything is that goes bad is ends up being blamed on being American. Excuse me. So, um, you know, consistency and being able to prove people wrong and um, showing up and, you know, and the other part of that was tough playing abroad is, you know, respecting them enough to realize that, you know, you know, I remember being in Nuremberg one time, I was having a hard time and this guy was talking to me. I really didn't understand him. And my teammate just says, you know, he wants you to go and get your oil checked and do this and do that. And I looked at him and I said, you speak English? We've been on the same team for two and a half years and you never, he's like, yeah, why would I speak English? We're in Germany, in German, right? And so understanding and respecting them enough to try to fit in and respect their culture, I think is important. And it's a great way to win people over. So mentally I had to, to realize that, you know, I wasn't home anymore and I had to adapt and fit in to their norm because that's where I was playing. Uh, how's your German today? Schlecht. <laughs> I would have thought that would have been your biggest challenge was, was the language, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see, we take a couple more questions here. We want to respect Tony's time and all. So let's see what else we got here. Um, uh, how old were you when you first started taking soccer seriously? Um, well, I, I guess seriously is relative, right? So, you know, um, you know, I would say, like I said, our teams were different there then. You know, we, we probably didn't have as much structured training as, as they do now. Um, which is good and bad. Um, but I had a group of friends that I played with every day, no matter what. So I could go to practice for an hour and a half and we'd go back in our neighborhood and play pickup. Right. And um, especially on the ages of like eight to 14, 
when your body isn't really physically broken down because you're not, you know, playing these long games and exhausted, you, you know, you could play a lot more outside. You could play in your backyard for hours and hours and still recover. So um, I would say, you know, at about, about 10 years old, I was in love with the game. Um, and so it wasn't hard work or practice, but that's what I did for fun. Uh, basketball. I mean, I can remember playing in a pickup basketball game with you one time in Berlin, uh, where you were the best guy on the court and you had me on your team and we still won, I think every game, but, uh, there were some big time players there, but you were a dual athlete, uh, was basketball, uh, well, actually you played tennis too, right? But, uh, basketball, um, soccer, when did... Was soccer always one for you or was that yeah, soccer soccer was always one you know I grew late I was I grew two and a half inches every year from eighth grade to my senior year so I played varsity in the eighth grade but I was five four and I think I weighed 98 pounds um so I grew late playing basketball and you know by the time colleges came to recruit me and I was an all, uh, all state point guard I already knew that I was going to play college soccer so uh, but I like I said even in Germany I, I played with the pro teams there and you know, you came and played and, you know, we had some guys from UNC that played there. Um, but for me, it was a way to keep my quick twitch muscles active. You know, being a tall, lanky player on the soccer field, sometimes, you know, you feel like you glide around people and your body movement and it becomes easy. But that basketball allowed me to like really hone in on my quick muscles and my my quickness because I was much bigger than the average person on the soccer field. That's great. Uh, all right, let's take one or two more here. Uh, reading the chat here. Uh, back to young players. How many minutes should young players be practicing daily? And when should young players start lifting weights? What's your opinion on that? Um, you know, this is, this is, I, you know, I don't want to say something I don't know. Um, uh, you know, the strength training has changed so much these days. Um, but I also see a lot more injuries these days. You know, I think, I think you can overtrain. Um, that's my personal opinion. Um, but I, I do think if I had, if I could help young players, I would say the strength training that I would recommend young people working on is their core. Um, their core, you know, there's different ways that you can work on it. I think natural body weight training personally will help you develop and, and, and get stronger. You know, you've heard this word like Herschel Walker. Um, but now there's a science to it. And, you know, I'm old school. So you know, that's, that's my opinion. And, and I'm sure there's some scientific data, data against it. Um, but again, the stronger you get, the better your recovery is, the more flexible you are. Um, in theory, the, you know, the less injured you're going to get. For me, I, I never was a big weightlifter. Um, but then again, like as I got older in my career, um, my lower body was so strong and my upper body was so weak that where they connected, I had a lot of injuries. So, um, if I had to do it again, I, I would really work on my core. Um, I think working on multiple sports, working on your quickness, agility are things that will help you. And so um, agility work, I think, is great. If if you have someone teaching you or you go and, and you can do it in a fun way, uh, I think all the better. Um, but those things are going to help you play and, and build your speed and strength naturally. Regrets. You got any regrets from your career? things that you would have liked to have made a different decision or would have gone a different way for you? You know, there's, you know, for the most of my career, no. I mean, there's a couple of times when, um, you know, where I thought about staying on a couple of teams and I didn't, um, you know, like I went to, to Nuremberg just to guarantee to play because of the world cup. You know, I left Nuremberg because I got in an argument with the coach and came back to America and, you know, took a $400,000 pay cut to prove a point. So um, maybe not my smartest decision. And then, you know, as I got older and I got injured in Chicago uh, and then wanting to leave when I was injured, um, you know, I did end up playing again, but I almost pulled the Latrell Sprewell. So, um, you know, I, I, I would have wished at times then I would have swallowed my pride a little bit, um, especially as I, as I got older in my career. You know, it was frustrating when you, when you give up so much and, and um, you don't feel like you're being treated fairly um, and you, you've accomplished. And that was hard for me, uh, especially, you know, in this country being from Minnesota, you know, nobody really cared or gave you, gave you, you know, the opportunities. And I actually had to go to Europe to, to prove that I was a world-class player. So 
Um, once we proved that, it was hard when, when, when I came back stateside and it was being questioned all over again. So um, those are some things where I may have made you know different decisions if I had a chance. And um, these aren't great things, but you know there are times when I know I was on my breaks and with the national team or in between and and we would go celebrate and party and you know I know that they directly you know impacted injury so if we go out after a game on a Wednesday and and drink a lot and you're older and your body doesn't recover and then you pull a muscle on Saturday and you know you miss four or five games a year you know for 17 years right that's that's 60 80 games you know and what does that up into 80 games 10 goals so you know, I could probably do the math on, you know, the, th you know, the three to $4 million I lost because of injuries that probably resulted in, in not taking care of my body, you know, the way that I, that I wanted to. Um, and, you know, the game is, is tough because um, you give up so much and, and then you have that, that short period of time to celebrate and get back to work and finding fun ways to celebrate um, that are healthy um is is what i would concentrate on, on now and i played till i was 39 and if i would have taken care of myself i probably could have played till i was 43. you and tom brady tony what's what's next for you uh we'll kind of wrap it up with this like you know going forward and i, I know you just had a uh a, a big birthday this past summer um so what, what's what's next in the next chapter of your of your life well, you know, I'm, I'm getting the foundation where I think it's going to be sustainable on its own. And, and I'm looking for other things as I, as I look to transition in the next few years. And, you know, I, I'm talking more with MLS, the league itself and getting involved more. And uh, you could meet, see me decide on the, on the player side as well. So um, I definitely have missed parts of the game and I think I'll start to get more and more involved in it, whether it's, it's training people or kids, um, you know, more hands-on, I think you'll, you'll see that. Um, and really looking at and how I can, you know, grow the impact of the game. Um, you know, the next World Cup here is not that far away. And so, you know, that's something that I want to be a part of and to make sure that the 20, you know, that World Cup leaves a legacy here in America. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to be helping and supporting work on as well. Awesome. Well, really appreciate your time. As I mentioned, uh, partway through, you know, I, I was always so proud of you as a player and as a friend and whatever. And when you told me that night uh, during the pandemic, we were talking for hours, whatever, about your foundation. And uh, it's it's pretty incredible. And we'll certainly try to uh, get people out and at least get to know who you are and who, who the foundation is. You know, obviously, they know who you are, but who the foundation is and and, and try to participate and help out in any way that we can. But thanks for taking the time on our leadership uh, Academy. We've had some big time Minnesotans and other people uh, on and you, you certainly fit that bill and, and thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Look forward to it. Everyone's welcome. So let me know. And we've got a great, great new center to come and play and, and meet some other kids. Thank you, Danny. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. Take care, buddy.